The so-called NATO alliance of the East meets in Dushanbe, but can it help stabilize Afghanistan? The now nine-member Eurasian security bloc hopes to contain any fallout from the Taliban's takeover, but can this hugely diverse group of nations agree on a common approach? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, or SCO, is underway in the Tajik capital with a clear focus on Afghanistan. As a neighbor to the bloc's mostly Central Asian members, its precarious situation since the Taliban took over has prompted many concerns, and determining how to prevent any instability from spilling over is a priority. But it won't be easy to reach a consensus with so many member states holding dramatically different views. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization was founded in 2001 as a multilateral group to tackle regional security issues, including terrorism, separatism, and religious extremism. The bloc is seen as an eastern alternative to NATO. In addition to Central Asian republics, the major member states include China, Russia, India, and Pakistan, plus Iran, with Afghanistan as an observer. Since 2005, Iran only had observer status. Applications for full membership were rejected in 2006 and again in 2015. But on Friday, it was announced that Iran was made a full member state, likely because of its nearly 1,000-kilometer-long border and key strategic role in dealing with Afghanistan. So with its newest member, the growing Eurasian club now turns its attention to Afghanistan, and the Taliban is providing a crucial test for the bloc's unity and sustainability. Beijing quickly established ties with Taliban leadership even before the group took over in Kabul. The Taliban says China is its most important partner, offering diplomatic support as well as financial aid. Russia, too, has shown a willingness to engage with Afghanistan's new leaders, but other SCO members, namely the Central Asian republics with Afghan borders, remain hesitant. Tajikistan stands in total opposition to the group, and India sees them as a Pakistani proxy. The biggest challenge facing this region relates to peace, security, and trust deficit. And its main cause of these growing problems is radicalization. The recent developments in Afghanistan have brought these problems to the fore. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization faces the task to negotiate a common line. Considering serious risks linked to the escalation of the situation in Afghanistan after the quick withdrawal to say an escape from this country of the U.S. forces and their NATO allies. Today, the Taliban control practically the entire territory of Afghanistan, and the new Afghan authority should be encouraged to fulfill their own promises to establish peace, normalize public life, and ensure security for all. So, with so many divisions, can this cooperation alliance find a common approach to help stabilize Afghanistan? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined from Bishkek by Niva Yao. She's a researcher at the OSCE Academy and a fellow at the Eurasia Program of Foreign Policy, the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. From Prague is Bruce Panier. He is a correspondent at Radio Free Europe, specializing in Central Asia. And in Rome, Harun Rahimi, an assistant professor of law at the American University of Afghanistan. Thanks all so much for being with us. Uh, first, I would really like to lay some groundwork and just get a better sense of how powerful or how influential this bloc really is. We outlined some of the differences in opinion on the Taliban there, but we, we also have to remember we have key member states, not least India and Pakistan, who view each other actually as adversaries, and others who geopolitically don't even see eye to eye really on anything. So, Neva, I'll start with you. Just how effective is the SCO? 
Well, the SEO is China's most important security instrument in the region. You know, China does a lot with individual Central Asian states, but the SEO really is the only platform where China is able to build consensus, you know, over issues that China is not able to work with just one country. For example, the Uyghur separatism issue, uh, the East Turkestan movement, which was uh, in uh, a problem that was, you know, across Central Asia. So the SEO in the initial days really helped China to push forward this effort. And today their presence has been significantly uh, limited. So when it comes to Afghanistan, you know, this is also uh, uh, the organization that China wants uh, to empower and wants uh, to be, you know, takes the lead into addressing all the Afghanistan related issues in the region. But specifically, how much is it a tool for Chinese interests? Uh, China, from the beginning, apart from security, also wanted the group to be more economic. And if you see the handouts from uh, Xi Jinping's speech today, you can see that, you know, there's so much about economics, uh, you know, mentioning of giving out loans again. Um, when it comes to the practicality, of course, the uh, China's economic initiatives through the SEO is not so much uh, successful as its security initiatives, which is, you know, establishing a regional day-to-day uh, -day mechanism in which uh, terrorist issues can be actually addressed. Like, for example, the RATS, uh, which is the regional anti-terrorism structure in Tashkent, has a database of persons of interest uh, that this region is concerned about. And this list is scanned through at each uh, border crossing. And at the same time, this uh, RATS also uh, now has an intense interest in the cybersecurity. And this is looking on internet about um, foreign fighter recruitment in the region and the movement of certain terrorists. So, you know, this is not just a platform for China to discuss uh, security issues with other countries, but it is also a platform where China is actually able to create and to assist uh, very practical measures to address terrorist issues. Okay. Let me just ask Bruce if, uh, if you're on the same page there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would agree with that. Um, you know, you, you pointed out rightly that there's some some significant divisions within the organization. I mean, it looks very intimidating on paper, obviously, when you look at the countries that are members of this. Think about the size of these countries, their populations. Uh, you know, it, it does look like a, a, some, a weighty counterweight to, to something with NATO. But, you know, w within that group, there's there's um, a lot of problems that, you know, you mentioned India and Pakistan, but there's, there's others with even within the Central Asian states. Uh, and certainly, uh, on many issues, they don't see eye to eye. Uh, if you look at the the final statement that they released today, it was very soft and, and kind of vague in some parts. I mean, they, they had some common ground, but there were really weren't very many specifics. Uh, and that's not surprising because, you know, you mentioned Tajikistan, for instance, does, has not had talks with the Taliban at all, uh, whereas its neighbor, Uzbekistan, has been engaged with the Taliban for, you know, more than three years now uh, and is still voicing uh, you know, support for keeping it certainly trade and economic ties with the government right. uh, in Af the current government in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, there's it, it, although it looks really powerful and menacing, uh, you know, in fact, you, you kind of wonder on on key issues, even like something like this with like Afghanistan, they're having a hard time finding, you know, total consensus. Some people see it, the Taliban being there's a threat. Uh, some people don't think it's that much of a threat and think they can still engage with them. Uh, and, but all of them yeah. think that, uh, you know, it, it, they have to wait a little bit um, and see uh, what happens. If I can get specific with you, though, Bruce, for a second, I mean, let's look at Tajikistan. It's, it's the host of this meeting, and it does not want to see uh, the Taliban given any official recognition. But they're up against China, who's already, you know, given partial recognition, at least in terms of, of aid. And uh, many expect that to turn into full legitimacy from China. Can Tajikistan you know, well, simply, yeah, be left out of the equation then? You know, this was always one of the problems they had when they they admitted uh, Pakistan and India. Uh, there was there was some concerns voiced that that the the Central Asians who were originally part of this uh, back when it was the Shanghai Five twenty five years ago. Um, you know that all of a sudden their voices wouldn't count for very much. The fact that it was the summit was in Dushanbe uh, made this a lot more interesting because. Uh, it, it was it was there, and that was we know what Tajikistan's view is. Uh, so there was clearly going to be a little bit of underlying tension in what was going on there. Uh, for instance, you know, Af who was going to represent Afghanistan, if anyone? Well, Sergey Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, yesterday said the invitation had gone out to Ashraf Ghani months ago, uh, and for mm. obvious reasons he couldn't accept that. But but one 
could have predicted, you know, after the Taliban came to power, that there was no way that, that Tajikistan would admit someone from the Taliban, or they certainly wouldn't want to see him there, even though Afghanistan still has observer status in that group. Uh, you know, so this was a problem, right. and this might be might be part of the reason that China, that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin didn't actually show up. Mm. Um, you know, I know Xi Jinping has not been out of the country for a long time, but uh, given the Tajik government's stance toward this. Uh, toward the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, um, it wasn't. It, there clearly wasn't going to be um, a lot of talk about. Okay, that's over, and, and now let's move on and cooperate with the government okay. that's in power because yeah. Rahman's against that. Harun, let me ask you. I mean, even with its maybe questionable efficacy, how much is the Taliban actually depending on the outcome of this meeting? So, I mean, I think the meet and the one thing and the common goal that uh, many countries in that meeting had was to make sure Afghanistan um, does not become a failed state again, um, does not become a place for terrorism. Um, it does It does not, there won't be spillovers from Afghanistan to other countries. And at this point, that will depend on Taliban's ability to govern Afghanistan. They are the only game in town. There is some pocket of resistance, but it's not that serious. So how to make sure the Taliban can actually govern Afghanistan. Um, that would be that was kind of the question I think that they were grappling with. Many countries would like Taliban to govern differently, uh, and they would condition uh, providing support for Taliban and supporting them in governing Afghanistan if they met certain demands. Other countries may have different demands or may see this uh, um, um, in different lights. So I think Taliban will need just for the just basic economics, if they wanted to be able to pay their salaries of their, of, their, of, their, of their government employees, if they want to be able to provide jobs for the Afghans, if they want to have any meaningful way of actually governing Afghanistan, they will need external support. Right. Um, that was going to be, have to be serious economic and financial support, but that's obviously tied with uh, tied to the international recognition. Mm -hmm. And all these countries were sitting, I think, basically uh, talking about how, under what conditions that support should be provided. And you mm -hmm. have to realize that these countries don't get to make all the rules as well. I mean, United States and the NATO is not there, but in terms of the international financial system and the way the world economy works, still the U.S. sanctions or the U.S. positions on Taliban is going to be incredibly consequential, but for what even China can do. I mean, China would may like to do a lot of investments in Iran, but sanctions stop it. Okay. So, I mean, it's not a completely contained system. Are we seeing, though, in a, in, in a sense, you know, the cart being put before the horse because the Taliban really needs to better sort out itself before it can go looking abroad uh, for more support and recognition? I think the, the, the problem is that Taliban cannot really. I mean, if they want, I mean, the, the economy is in basically a nosedive. Um, mm. It's a huge economic issue, a disaster unfolding in slow motion. There is a huge um, humanitarian crisis unfolding. So unless there is an, some sort of immediate intervention, financial in nature, economic in nature, I don't think the Taliban can actually govern just simplistic. I mean, it's gonna the state may fail uh, before it actually is able to form. And I think that's what Taliban actually are proposing. They're saying we need time to meet your expectations, the international community or to many actors, but you cannot condition, you cannot ask us to deliver before you help us out. Right. I think that is kind of the proposal that they're, they're putting to the world. Neva, I can see you agree there. Yeah, absolutely agree because, you know, so much of this discussion about China and Taliban is the fact that, you know, China still does not trust Taliban after 10 years of, you know, public and private engagement. Um, and part of this trust issue is the fact that, you know, Taliban has been uh, hiding members of East Turkestan movement and working with uh, Uyghur, ethnic Uyghur uh, foreign fighters in Afghanistan and training them. Um, and, you know, unless uh, the Taliban is actually able to give very concrete uh, uh, evidence and actually give away these people, China is not going to be satisfied. A couple of weeks ago, uh, China has a, a fresh statement, and in there it was uh, quite harshly saying that oh, it recognizes there is a, a, a new government in Kabul, 
uh, but uh, China still wishes to see the government to be inclusive, frankly, because China recognizes that, you know, this uh, government in Kabul right now is not inclusive. It is not ethnically diverse. It does not include uh, uh, the, any members of the, of the former Afghan government. And uh, it is not a scenario that China wishes, wishes to see, because this also means that uh, the Islamic policy that this Kabul government has right now for its own country and for the region, uh, broadly speaking, is uh, also another worry of China that uh, uh, you know would be considered as a, a ticking time bomb. So China is not rushing to recognize uh, a Taliban and until you know all these uh, conditions are met. Although once uh, these conditions are met, uh, we can be very sure that you know okay. uh, China's uh, pockets are open and this uh, financial help will be uh, extremely important to the Taliban's uh, successful governance mm. of the country. I, I, Niba, if I can ask you though quickly, I mean, how much uh, of a priority really is the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative? How much do they want to be able to have a decent relationship with the Taliban in order to push that forward? And how much would that take priority over, over whatever relationship the Taliban may or may not have with the Uyghur population? China's Belt and Road Initiative is so important, not because it is Xi Jinping's foreign policy. This is part of a policy, a long-term policy, to shift global trade from sea-based to land-based. Because sea-based global trade is a game of Western countries, you know, with, na with powerful naval powers, and land-based trade is a. It would be much more uh, feasible for China to be uh, a dominant player in that. And so the whole point of Belt and Road Initiative is to build this land-based trade route. So currently we have uh, this. Uh, road going from Kazakhstan out of uh, Xinjiang, but China needs many, many uh, di uh, diversi diversification in terms of roads. Okay. And one of the biggest bottleneck of the China Kyrgyzstan Uzbekistan railway is the fact that this railway ends in Uzbekistan and it doesn't go anywhere else. But now that Afghanistan could become more stable and can actually accommodate large uh, uh, connectivity infrastructure, this is a turning page in the age of Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, interesting. Uh, Bruce, if I can move forward with you, if you really do feel you have something to say about uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, you can go ahead. But if not, I really want to ask about this recognition of Iran uh, as a full member now. Why, after so many years and rejected applications, did it finally happen? And what does the United States in particular fear about that recognition? Well, you know, this is interesting timing. I mean, you'd almost have to connect it with the Western withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, you know, with, with all those, uh, with NATO troops and U.S. troops and everything right next door to Iran uh, in Afghanistan. Um, this was pretty hard because part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a mutual defense treaty. Uh, you know, it's still interesting to see, you know, Iran Iran was formally admitted, but but the process, the accession process is still going to take it a little while. Um, so this has always been a big question with Iran is, is uh, how far are they going to go? You know, admittedly, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has dodged conflicts before that have involved uh, in some of its members. They were internal conflicts, but they haven't they haven't gotten involved. So they've already kind of shown a reluctance to get uh, involved in a, in individual countries' problems before, um, but you know you would have to if you're Israel, say, or somebody like that, then you you have to take a, a close look at this and try to figure out where that leaves you. Um, you know, if they, if they really are going to get this kind of support from China, Russia, uh, in the event of some kind of attack, does the mutual defense clause come into come into effect? Uh, but but sure, you know, like I said, surely Iran being allowed in now has to do a lot with the Western departure from, you know, the neighboring country, uh, mm. Afghanistan, at the moment. Okay. Harun, quick comments on that. I agree. Mm. Uh, I think um, it is meant to bring all uh, major players, um, in the case of Afghanistan, together. And I think um, with the Iran playing a major role in the region, um, it was the and the vacuum created by the U.S. withdrawal. It made perfect sense to bring the Iran in at this point, and I would connect it to the U.S. withdrawal and the fact that Afghanistan is going to be the major security issue for all these major players. Okay, uh, Harun, I'm going to stick with you because I need to ask you about uh, Pakistan. The uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan had actually warned, as he said, he was warning against the mischievous propaganda on the part of spoilers, uh, saying they will only serve to undermine the prospects for peace in Afghanistan and the region. 
Expand on what you think he's actually talking about and who specifically does he believe are the spoilers? Are they also fellow members of the SCO? I believe absolutely. I mean, um, India uh, would be the, the internet audience. The suffix is obviously uh, directed towards India, but also Tajikistan, as you pointed out, has uh, advocated against engagement with the Taliban. Uh, Pakistan has been a strong advocate for engaging with the Taliban. You have to realize that the Pakistan cannot really support the uh, Taliban government financially or in any serious way. Um, they would have, they would be have to be an, major backers, and China is the main candidate. And I think the Pakistan will uh, do what it can to advocate for engagement, for recognition of Taliban, because it sees Taliban as its most friendly government Afghanistan has had for a very long time towards mm -hmm. Pakistan, and the most unfriendly government Afghanistan has had for a very long time towards India, because Pakistan would see any kind of shift against India in Afghanistan uh, as as a strategic gain for itself, uh, but. But I think the issue, I mean, many countries are dealing with, I mean, the, the path isolation was tried in the 90s. The you know, Taliban became a prior state. It did not really help much achieve anyone's goal, and it laid the ground for all of the horrible things and terrorism flourishing there. So I think the countries, even without Pakistan saying, are thinking that right. they have to engage with Taliban. I think historically they've, they've concluded that. But the question is, under what terms, what Taliban have to, to do to yeah, because the basic minimum to earn engagement? He, spe he specifically said that the Taliban has to fulfill its pledges specifically for a politically inclusive structure. I mean, does he really believe they'll provide that inclusivity and will Pakistan be able to pressure them to do so? I, I don't think so. I mean, also, you have to realize that the Pakistan policy towards Afghanistan is not necessarily the, the, uh, the prerogative of the prime minister. Uh, I, I don't know how much his views represent the, the views of military establishment in, in, in Pakistan. He could personally, as the government, advocate for more inclusivity, but that's not going to be the, the litmus test for Pakistan because there are other stakeholders inside Pakistan to make those decisions. Okay. I think so far, the track record, I think the countries who are arguing against engagement are saying Taliban haven't delivered any of their promises to, and why we should not reward their be so behavior so far with engagement. Even China and other countries remaining cold, I think are trying to message to Taliban that you have to do more to, uh, for us to engage. Okay, Neva, I saw you nodding your head, but we only have a few minutes left, so I want to end with this. If the member states do not reach some kind of consensus at this meeting, what happens and who in the region will arguably suffer the most? Well, we already see that uh, both China and Russia and Pakistan are hosting all of these uh, regional governments meetings to address Afghanistan. So this uh, consensus building process is, doesn't stop at SEO. It is expanding into uh, different structures that uh, different countries are creating. Everyone is talking to each other, trying to come to consensus. So this process is we are still going to see to the rest of the year. I think many countries are pragmatic and they really need to see Taliban come to be an inclusive government to uh, stop this pro longing uh, conflicts in the country. Okay. Bruce, your thoughts? Well, you know, there, there seems to be a lot going on behind the scenes uh, at the moment, too. You know, we've mentioned Tajikistan and its stance against the Taliban, but Tajikistan is not a big country. And without some kind of guarantees uh, behind closed doors or something, they, I, I doubt that they would be so vocal about what's going on. Russia, of course, has been holding military exercises with Tajikistan and with Uzbekistan uh, and, the, and the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is Russian-led within the CIS, is going to hold more military exercises in Central Asia. So while Russia's saying maybe we can deal with these people, uh, the message they're telling the Central Asians is, you know, you have to be militarily prepared for uh, Afghan spillover, not necessarily the Taliban, but some of these other groups that, that, that have uh, allied themselves with the Taliban during the course of the conflict over the last 20 years. So, and we can't even discount the fact that China, to some extent, supports uh, you know, what the, the what Russia is doing in Central Asia and what Russia is thinking. You know, Tajikistan is the mouthpiece for this. Uh, but, you know, you can't forget that China has a small military uh, outpost in eastern Tajikistan, not far from the Afghan border, on their own. So that, you know, they're they're hedging their bets on a lot of this stuff. While everyone's saying, you know, let's let's engage or, or let's, let, let's give them a chance, they're also at the same time making preparations for a worst-case scenario where this doesn't work out and the Taliban government uh, either doesn't, 
keep its word or is unable to keep control, and all of a sudden mm. problems develop that could spill over into neighboring countries. I'm going to let you expand on that, Bruce. And what is the worst case scenario for the region? Uh, well, the worst case scenario would would be that uh, I suppose civil war would continue. It, it's it's really kind of a mixed bag. You know, there's the thought that if the Taliban do take control, then they do have all these foreign fighters in their country, and maybe they wouldn't be welcome in Afghanistan all of a sudden. And where would they go? Some of them come from Central Asia, and you know, and Neva's already mentioned there's there's Uyghurs uh, from militant groups that have experience on the battlefields in Syria and Iraq. Uh, you know, what happens to them if the Taliban finally decide that we have peace in our country, and and you guys are are uh, are un not welcome anymore because you kind of ruin our chances for international funding and things like that. Uh, however, you know, if the if civil war breaks out, uh, if the Taliban aren't able to keep control, um, then you know you have an, the you have the additional problem of uh, where we were in the mid 1990s, where you never know when people are going to come across the border. Uh, there's drug smuggling that goes on. There's weapon smuggling that goes on. I mean, it, it helps to destabilize all those regions right along the border. So, um, right. you know, it, it's tough. Okay, Bruce, I'm going to let you have the last word. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition. Of the newsmakers, I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for joining us and our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore newsmakers. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.